Welcome to the Nonprofit Report, your weekly update on nonprofit organizations, issues, and leaders. I'm your host, Mark Oppenheim, and today we will talk about community foundations with guests. Matthew Randazzo, President and CEO of the Dallas Foundation, and Dan Smith, President and CEO of the Vermont Community Foundation. So thank you for joining us. So you both run community foundations that advise donors and marshal resources to invest in your community. And, you know, it's great to have you both because usually at this time of year, Vermont is cold and Texas isn't. Texas has just had an epic, epic weather event, and there is so much need throughout Texas. Um, and Vermont is, is, is taking uh, weather in stride, as Vermonters uh, do. Um, let's talk a, a little bit about the issues that you face. And uh, Dan, if you don't mind, I'm going to start with Matthew, since his state has really been, been hammered and, and uh, his organization is, is really doing its best to, to help uh, its, its constituents. Matthew, could you just talk about the role that you play and particularly with reference to this event? Yeah, appreciate it, Mark, and glad to be here with Dan and the team. Um, you know, the Dallas Foundation really partners hand in glove with our civic leaders in the community. So work closely with the mayor and the county judge, which is sort of like a county executive in Texas, to really be sure that we're marshalling philanthropic resources that's meeting the moment. You know, with this winter storm, we are expecting hundreds of billions of dollars of damage throughout the state of Texas. As I shared with Mark prior to the start of the call, within a week's time, we had an 83 degree swing in temperature. So we were uh, two below zero uh, nine days ago and, and just two days ago, we hit 81 degrees. So it, it has been a wild ride for many Texans. I think specific to North Texas and to Dallas in particular, what we're seeing is dramatic water damage to homes as pipes, pipes have burst. We see a lot of folks who are underinsured um, that don't have renter's insurance or homeowners that don't have adequate policy will def definitely be relying on FEMA. But if there's a positive side to this story, it is that the, the philanthropic community in Dallas is generous, individuals, institutions, and corporations. So last Friday, when we weathered the worst part of the storm, uh, when the sun came out and when we could actually get broadband, believe it or not, like broadband lines and fiber lines were frozen, like large neighborhoods could not even access Wi-Fi. We had a call in, uh, with 83 funders throughout the community, corporations and foundations that came together instantly to begin pushing resources out. Um, that's the generosity that we see in this community. Uh, we were very fortunate to receive a million dollar gift from Mark Cuban that we have been deploying to nonprofits throughout um, North Texas to really meet the need. So um, we still have challenges with clean drinking water. We still have all the home rental repairs. We have food insecurity that is a holdover from COVID. We have empty grocery stores. Um, it, it's a real challenge, but the philanthropic community is really rising to meet it. And the Dallas Foundation plays an important coordinating role. You know, it's, it's so interesting that we so often in this country have this discussion about government and private as if it's oppositional, but it's really complementary. There are things that government does well, but acting instantaneously is not necessarily one of them. Turning on the dime is not necessarily one of them. You could get on a call and, and um, donors could, could start money flowing without votes, without debate. Uh, now, that's not uh, the right way to go for, for every situation. But Dan, as you look at Vermont, and Vermont is famous for its community-based um, sort of inside out, right? Bottom up, inside out, you know, not, not a top-down approach is what I'm saying. Uh, could you talk about how you interact with your communities with reference to what Matthew was saying for the much larger state and the most much larger region? <clears throat> Sure, and I just want to compliment Matt and uh, sort of extend our um, thoughts in regards to what what uh, Dallas, North Texas, and Texas has been experiencing in the last uh, ten days. It's just uh, um, incredible to see. But I think Matt uh, Matthew hit on a really important thing, which is you know the ability of uh, a community foundation to step in and understand where public and private um, resources across multiple funders, the ways in which they can complement complement each other and show up. Uh, uh, um, in a, at the community level in ways that are reinforcing each other's work, both in terms of scale of resources and in the timing of resources. Because sometimes smaller and faster gets there quicker and sets the foundation for public investment to actually be more effective in the long term. 
Um, you know, in Vermont, our focus, we, we put an incredible emphasis on community engagement, really understanding that as we run different grant programs and work with different funders, and use different tools like our place-based mission investing, it's really incumbent upon the community foundation to understand, and we're a statewide foundation. We cover all 250 odd communities in the state, really understand how those uh, programs and those projects show up in particular places. So, you know, if you're walking down the street in Springfield, Vermont, you may not really think it's relevant if it came from the McClure Foundation Supporting Organization Grant Program or the Let's Grow Kids Program or our Regional and Local Impact Initiative. But what makes you feel good about your place and that offers a sense of momentum is that these resources are showing up and reinforcing each other. And we can't do that if we're not really listening intently in places, engaging thoughtfully, being really, really deliberate about the voices we bring in uh, to in, uh, and bring in and empower uh, the insight that we generate about what's going on in communities. And, and Vermont lends itself to that, frankly, because you know, we are a constellation of small places with a high degree of social intersection between, uh, between people in those places and a high degree of sort of affinity for place. Um, that said, you know, the trends of the last couple of decades have left us vulnerable to many of the same sort of um, uh, the same uh, challenges that I think we're seeing as a nation. And so it's important for the Community Foundation to be thinking about and how we rebuild that sense of connection in places uh, as well. You know, if, if you look at America, America is so often divided by uh, levels of wealth. And you're talking about a Community Foundation where you have people who have means are contributing uh, very often to programs for people in need, right? There, we're also divided by, uh, by race, which also uh, uh, maps to wealth. Um, there are so many sensitivities surrounding these various topics. Um, Matthew, when you interact with the various communities, how do you create this dialogue so that people are informed, people are sensitized? Um, you know, we had a situation recently where some unfortunate language got into one of our, our uh, documents online and we took it down as soon as we were aware. But you know, no matter how long you work in these issues, you are going to make mistakes. How do you create this impetus for change and the education that all of us need, you know, right? the, the redirection that all of us need from people who know more than we do about various aspects of the community that we all try and serve? Yeah, I appreciate that. I mean, I think there are a handful of strategies that we're deploying in you know, the last couple of years. First is you have to have authentic engagement from the community that you're serving. And that does not mean just the grass tops. It doesn't mean just city council members and, um, and, and other civic leaders. It really means connecting directly with nonprofits who are working in the community to improve the lives and outcomes of our friends and neighbors in North Texas. So that's been a real intentional focus of ensuring that those organizations have a proverbial seat at the table. You know, the, the example I like to use is, um, you know, hosting a community meeting with metal folding chairs in a church, you know, that the optics of that might be great, but actually what we need to do is invite the community into the cushy boardroom chairs to have a seat at the table and really help direct our strategy. So that's been a really important thing. The other thing I would point to is really our discovery as an organization around racial equity work. You know, we've been leaning into this work over the course of my tenure at the foundation, which has been coming up on three years, and really understanding um, how the leadership role that we have in bringing our donors and stakeholders along on this continuum. And so a really specific example is we brought our donors through some racial equity training last fall. And our donors were excited and they are expecting more because at the end of the day, as you know, you know, it, it, at least in the case of the Dallas Foundation, we have about $500 million in assets, the vast majority of which are donor advised. And so last year, as an example, the Dallas Foundation brought in about $105 million in new philanthropic assets. 100, 100, 105 million of 105 new- 105 million last year last year during COVID and the, the far more important figure is we put 70 million of it right out into the community. So if we want to sort of really authentically partner with community and we wanna drive outcomes, we have to have this sort of racial equity lens and not just as an institution, 
institution, but our donor advised fund holders, because they're putting the vast majority of philanthropic resources out to the community. So those are a couple of ways we have, um, we've been building our muscle to be more connected to the community and, and more diverse, equitable, and inclusive as an institution. So, you, so the, this education and dialogue is so important. We just completed a, phone, uh, a, a poll down um, in which we asked, you know, have you donated to or received a grant from a community foundation? 80%. Now, remember, this is a select audience, but 80% of people have said yes. They've either received a, a grant or donated through a, a community foundation. Uh, Dan, uh, same question to you. How do you uh, facilitate understanding when we naturally have been divided by systemic uh, features in our society that we are now trying to break down, right? We're trying to do right. things that we haven't done before and that might feel less um, uh, part of our daily lives, but we have to change how we function. How do you, how do you facilitate that so that there's understanding between these various groups? <clears throat> I, mean, I, I think Matt, Matthew hit on some key efforts that um, you know, uh, reflect our approach as well at the Vermont Community Foundation, which is really uh, endeavoring to surface the voices of those who are most um, uh, affected by both the challenges we're trying to go to work on and uh, the systems that are frankly holding in place the disparate experiences that we know exist by race, by class, uh, by region and in, in, uh, across uh, the state of Vermont. And so, uh, by surfacing those experiences and really authentically embedding them in our governance, in our um, in our strategies, and in our understanding in ways that inform our work. So uh, governance, 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 strategy, um, strategy, and understanding, and understand. Um, but I, I, I will say that there's a there's a design challenge on the part of both the community foundation and any funder in when it comes to community engagement that is worth calling out. At least you know we've run into it, which is. You know, when you show up as a funder in place, you know, it and call it out and say, hey, we're going to do this engagement, it immediately creates both a power dynamic and it skews the insight you generate about the place, right? Because people show up conscious of the power dynamic and conscious of the fact that uh, you're a, uh, you as an organization may be positioned to help them with an immediate need or, or their organization with need. So you may, may not necessarily get the most authentic view of where capacity exists in the community, where leadership exists, where social capital exists. And so in some cases, engaging in a community may mean being really, really quiet and observing and listening and reflecting around the data and trends in communities, and then surfacing where, those, uh, where social capital exists, who are those quiet leaders in a particular neighborhood where, uh, that people turn to for insight and advice. And then the key thing that I think lends potency to a community foundation's effectiveness is the ability to turn that into insight that can then get shared across the donor advised fund holders. And you can build aligned independent philanthropy that goes to work in place, uh, hopefully in a really effective way. Because I think Matthew is absolutely right. The power of a community foundation, you know, in most, in most cases, in many cases, our, our discretionary grant funding is, you know, capacity is relatively modest. It's the ability to capture insight and understanding uh, and turn that into uh, activated donor advised funds who are going to work on the things uh, and based on the understanding you can help surface. And I think the racial equity, the role of a community foundation in addressing racial equity is a, a wonderful example of it. We have funders turning to us for insight um, and information and advice around how to go to work because it's a complex issue that compels people to wrestle with privilege, the source of their wealth, history, and they, but they want to go to work on it and they're not sure where to start. And we want to go to work on it. And in many cases, we're not sure where to start. So how do we uh, empower voices that can help us um, bring funders along on that journey, bring our organization along on that journey, bring our governance along on that journey? It's going to be incredible, incredibly important, but it also demonstrates the, the, the value, flexibility, curiosity, uh, and, and insight uh, that is, uh, I think, the true potency of a community. Well, it starts by your own. It starts by admitting. I'm sorry, we're getting some feedback. It starts by admitting your own um, ignorance and asking people who know more for their help and um, having them inform. Um, as as you take a look at your priorities, you your donors cannot fund everything, right, Matthew? So that's right. How do you decide, right? How do, how do you 
you triage so that you're having the most impact in the various areas that your donor, donors are passionate about, uh, about addressing? I think this has been our biggest shift as an institution over the course of the last few years. And that is, I do believe the expectation of many community foundations is to be a mile wide and an inch deep. We have to have an understanding of all of the issues that our donors care about. And that is as varied from arts and cultural institutions to higher ed to K-12, et cetera, et cetera. And so we developed this frame for our board to say, we, we sort of think of it as a T, right? So to, to a certain extent, we do have to be a mile wide and an inch deep and have our finger on the pulse of the major issues in our community. What makes Dallas a world-class community? And what are the things that need support to ensure that our friends and neighbors have equitable access to opportunity and well-being? And the, the, the sort of vertical on that is the place where we will go deep and that is the reduction of intergenerational poverty. And so in 2019, our board set a North Star of, of reducing the rate of childhood poverty in Dallas County by, by 50% within a generation. Uh, we, we, are, we have stick to as an institution to say, we are gonna lean into this over the course of the next 20 years. We are putting almost all of our uh, discretionary funding to a strategy to reduce childhood poverty. We have, uh, we're on the cusp of launching a, a major fund where we are um, aggregating our donor advised fund holders and other institutional funders to co-invest with us. And, um, and, and that's, that's the work. Now that said, we also know it's, uh, it's, it's the universe reminding us. I mean, on the tails of adopting this strategy, COVID hit. And then a year into that, we have this winter storm mayhem. And so we've really struggled as an institution to really say, okay, yes, we do want to go deep, but it's also the role of a community foundation to be responsive to the needs of the community in any given moment. And so we're trying to calibrate that, right? So how do we think about storm recovery right now through the lens of our child well-being strategy? The good news is there's a lot of overlap there. And so we can still be responsive to the community, get resources out and target those institutions that are serving the youngest in our community to ensure they have what they need to weather, no pun intended, the current storm. So that's the tension I think that, that community foundations will face, that long-term strategic North Star with being immediately responsive to community needs. And, and the last thing I'll say, and, and not being arrogant to assume you know what the immediate needs are. And I think Dan said that so well. It's like, you know, having a finger on a pulse, but gut checking that with people who are in the community and have the lived experience um, is really critical. We just completed a poll, Dan, and um, we, we asked what guides uh, funders most. And we, we uh, provided a multiple choice answer. And it was very interesting. 72% said cause. The, um, then we had um, specific communities, so, ge so ge geography or individuals uh, impacted. Mm -hmm. um, and then we had data, so uh, evidence of impact. And then uh, opportunity to be personally involved was about 16%. So uh, those, that seemed to be the mix. Um, are you finding that that, that cause, the, the actual cause, not necessarily the individuals who are impacted, but the cause is the thing that guides your donors the most? I actually, um, given the nature of Vermont communities, um, I think there's a, there's a segment of donors who are uh, highly activated around a particular issue or a cause, and they get very inquisitive. And that's, again, where I think a community foundation can add value because you can reflect on that particular issue or that particular cause and provide some insight about how that plays out in small towns and villages and cities across across a, a particular geography or place in ours, Vermont. But in Vermont, I, I think more of our funders are actually highly activated by place, whether it's the Northeast Kingdom region uh, of Vermont, you know, high poverty, but incredibly beautiful um, and, and, and stark and a deep, deep seated sense of community in that place. Um, people are, there are funders who are just incredibly passionate about place. Uh, in the communities that are embedded in the North. So uh, in some cases, you know, uh, where we think about our role is really to lend structure to how philanthropy can show up in that place. And we've undergone a similar, uh, a similar exercise to what the Dallas has gone through, really organizing philanthropy based on the trends of rural communities in Vermont around uh, this question of intergenerational opportunity, the opportunity gap that exists 
our, our low income youth and BIPOC youth who were born in rural communities in Vermont. Uh, and we've organized our thinking. And again, the exercises in building a strategic framework, aligning our discretionary grant, grant making, and then and working to build donor advised fund holder interest in coming along with us on that journey of change over time, and really leaning on the, the wealth that's embedded in a community foundation to change the circumstances of the most vulnerable members of our communities. And, uh, we got a question on that, um, which you might be able to, to uh, answer. Um, we were asked by one of our attendees, and by the way, uh, please attendees ask questions. We'll, we'll try and deal with them. We were asked by one of our attendees, in your actual decision-making processes and your prioritization, how do you query, how do you ensure that, uh, that some of the people who um, are perhaps uh, the potential recipients actually have a voice in the, in the decision. It's a very sensitive issue because if you're going to be a, a potentially a receiver of that, uh, of that grant, right? How do you make sure that, that those communities, those populations, whoever they are, are actually heard rather than uh, you have kind of a paternalistic top-down kind of an approach? Dan, uh, how, how do you do that? Well, I mean, I'd say it's a it's a work in progress, um, you know, and I think it's a, something about which organizations like ours can can constantly strive to get better. Um, but we run a number of uh, community based and um, uh, grant rounds and grant programs, uh, whether they're regional or they're focused on a particular population or set of issues in which we strive to bring the lived experience of, um, of those particular communities or those populations to bear on the grant making decision uh, of those of those committee advised funds. So that's a, a key a key um, a key point of practice. We also partner with the Vermont Council on Rural Development and a community facilitation process that is um, you know, known as the community visit process. They engage really deeply in a particular community and surface the objectives, aspirations, and challenges of a place and a really comp with a really comprehensive engagement process. What I appreciate about that uh, exercise is that it takes the funder out of it. And so we can listen and learn from the process without potentially skewing the power dynamic in that. And that then informs the strategy that we use to show up in place. Um, so do you both ensure that, that there's representation uh, on your boards uh, so that uh, the people who are uh, most powerful in your organizations um, also have insight? I missed the first part of that question. Can you repeat the first do you, part? Do you ensure that you have representation on your boards that is not that is not defined by uh, social strata or wealth or those kinds of, uh, of factors? but people who have other expertise um, so that the people who are most powerful in your organizations um, also are composed of, of, of diverse viewpoints and perspectives and lived experiences. I, I think the Dallas Foundation has really tracked a three-pronged approach to answer the attendees question. One is looking at the governance structure. You know, when I joined the organization, we had two people of color on our governing board, wildly unrepresentative of the communities that we're serving. And so we really leaned into ensuring that we had the right gender mix, ensuring that we're recruiting uh, people of color to serve in, in governing positions at the organization, setting those individuals up to actually chair committees and to, uh, to be on a pathway to board chairmanship. Um, really looking at, um, again, diversity and representation from a very broad lens, ensuring that we had some young people on our board because next gen philanthropy feels wildly different than my, you know, our father's philanthropy or even philanthropy today. Um, looking to ensure that we have LGBTQ representation. We have a vibrant LGBTQ community in Dallas that was absent from the institution's history. And so really thinking about that board piece and then real intentionality at staff level hires. We brought five new individuals into the organization last year, all of whom are people of color and many of whom are people managers. As an institution, we did not do a particularly good job at hiring um, people of color to be in leadership and people management positions. And we know that's critically important as we think about having a strategy that is responsive to the community that we're serving. And then the last example I want to give to you, and this is a little niche to our sector, is many community foundations have what are called field of interest funds. So donor leaves a bequest around a very specific lens of support for the community. We had a fund, uh, have a fund, excuse me, that is for the quote unquote advancement of the black community. 
This is a fund that was established in the 1970s. Since the 1970s, we've had one African-American serve on the committee that oversaw that fund. So I went to our board two years ago and I said, I would like you all to relinquish your decision-making of this fund and instead appoint a board of community volunteers from the African-American community that are closer to the work and have the lived experience. And so we now have this, it's called the Petulo Fund, community volunteers that are coming in, that are sourcing applications and directing that philanthropy. Um, so, so these are some of the examples of ensuring that we've got voice um, and, and real leadership um, decision-making, uh, you know, among the, the constituents that we're serving in a, in a far diver more diverse constituent than we've done previously. You know, these, these are really complicated issues. Um, Dan, you also have um, a, an element that, that uh, Matthew doesn't have as much in that um, you have uh, small towns, uh, modest sized towns, and then you have vast rural tracts. Um, and voice there is also very important. Um, how do you ensure that you balance those different voices? Well, again, it's about, uh, uh, in our view, it's about prioritizing how we're engaging in terms of our staff time uh, it, by where we're engaging. And the first look we took right after I started was mapping out where our grant making showed up in place. Um, and so across 250 uh, every uh, towns in every corner of the state. And we realized, not surprisingly, across the competitive grant rounds we were running, uh, the programs we were running, and then our donor advised fund grant uh, grant making was concentrating in one particular region. There was a stronger economic base, there was more wealth, there was more intersection between the nonprofit sector and our donor advised fund holders. So we put a premium, uh -huh. frankly, on a regional uh, regional approach to our discretionary grant making to frankly complement that. So we weren't uh, running the risk of leaving smaller communities and rural communities behind in terms of our community impact. Um, <clears throat> you know, I wanted to go back and answer the question about engaging uh, engaging voices, um, both in terms of racial diversity and socioeconomic diversity in our governance. You know, frankly, Vermont is an overwhelmingly white state. And, you know, the, the question for us is not actually building governance that reflects where Vermont is as a state, but it's about reflect, building governance that reflects where we want to go as a state. Um, and so what we aspire to be. And we know that the younger demographics in Vermont are actually much more racially diverse. And so our hope, uh, it's a slow process of turning over governance, but our hope and aspiration is that we can diversify our board in ways that are more racially and ethnically diverse, that are more generationally diverse, and then more diverse in terms of the lived experience of uh, people economically in rural communities. Um, and that, that will allow us to do a better job of you know, reflecting where we want to go in terms of building community resilience and equity in the long term. So. Well, my daughter is, as, as, I, as I said, uh, uh, before the program, my daughter attended a school in Vermont and as a young woman of color, um, she actually had a very uh, interesting and very positive experience of engaging with people who, um, who were interested in, in that future and, and wanted to embrace it and were, um, were on a journey to, uh, in terms of how they would embrace it uh, in, in a very positive way. Um, we just finished another poll, which is uh, really interesting. I'm going to give uh, Matthew, you the last word since I started off. Uh, no, I'm sorry. Dan's, Dan's going to get the last word. So we're going to go to Matthew, and then we're going to go to go to Dan, and then we're going to wind up because we're coming to the end of our time. Our poll showed, we, we asked, uh, what need is top priority for community right now? 38% said children and family. 31% said justice and poverty. Then came education and health, uh, about the same. So we have children and family, justice and poverty, education and health. So Matthew, could you comment on how your donors see it? Do your donors see this as being children and families uh, first, justice and poverty, education and health? Or do you have, uh, and I know you have to encompass other priorities as well, but in general, is, is that how your donors see this, this situation? Yeah. I mean, it's bang on. And, and we, we recognize that the, the, these things are inextricably linked. And so in our community, what we're, what we're grappling with is the fact that Dallas has the third highest rate of childhood poverty in the country. We have among the highest rates of, of uh, or excuse me, the highest gaps of racial wage and wealth gaps. We have just huge challenges as it relates to justice. And what I, what I refer to as economic justice 
and racial equity. Those things are inextricably linked. And of course, our K-12 systems and our public schooling systems are really the centerpiece that either perpetuate the inequality or have the opportunity to break these generational cycles of poverty. So I think you know our, our attendees today, they have their finger on the pulse of the challenges that we're really working through here in Dallas for sure. And Dan, is, is that how your donors see this, this, this sort of split between these four different major areas? I, I would say largely, and those are highly reflective of the strategies that we've leaned on to close the opportunity gap in Vermont, you know, early childhood care and learning, uh, college continuation and career training, support for youth and families, and this idea of the community and economic vitality so people see their place as one that offers them opportunity and a potential to be financially secure and civically engaged. I, I think that the one that I didn't hear reflected in that list that comes up for our donors with a high degree of frequency is around conservation and climate. Um, and there's really interesting work being done among some of our donors and some of our partners uh, around the intersection between climate and community resilience in rural communities. As the agricultural sector transitions from a commodity dairy environment in Vermont, uh, what happens to these you know, vast acres of con conserved farmlands uh, as they become economically less and less you know, viable, what does that do to the towns that rely on those farms? What does that do to the towns that have relied on that industry? And how do you, how do you really think about the long-term implications of changing climate for rural communities? Um, and I think that is gonna be an important one for us to wrestle with because it creates a disparate experience again between rural communities and then where there's a hospital or more urban density in Vermont and there's some more economic backbone to some places. And that, you know, that again, that disparate and disconnected experience is one that I think threatens long-term civic and social connectivity in a particular place. Such an important point. Um, I, I'd like to thank you both for sharing the work that you do. The thing that strikes me is that you have a, a, a very small state in the Northeast, uh, Dallas in, in the heart of Texas, uh, really totally different uh, environments, but very, very similar ideas and operations and, and philosophies and a co total commitment to uh, helping people. Ending on a note of uh, attention to uh, the climate situation just seems so appropriate given what's happened in your state, Matthew. Let's all try and help Texas to the extent that we can. If you are a plumber, go to Texas. If you are <laughs> if you are, uh, if you have skills on the electrical uh, uh, repair grid, go to Texas. And if you can give, give to Texas. Um, thank you so much. Um, Matthew Randazos, uh, President CEO of the Dallas Foundation. Dan Smith, President CEO of the Vermont Community Foundation. That's the nonprofit report. Everybody stay safe. Everybody mask up. And please uh, help each other. Yes, exactly, right? There we go, there we go. From all across America, California, <laughs> Texas, Vermont, we have our masks. Uh, that's the nonprofit report. Attendees, thank you so much. Have a great day, stay safe. <music>